Every time I come to Coast Bible Church, the assignment gets tougher. And this time, he's given me the granddaddy of all my assignments. Uh, I have to cover the book of Romans in four nights. Can you believe it? I will do my best, as Arch always did in my, in my classroom. Uh, whether I'll be as, as successful as he uh, used to be, I'm not sure of that. But we're going to make an effort at it. I have decided to divide my uh, study of the book of Romans into basically three units. Tomorrow night, we will cover chapters one through four. Uh, on uh, Tuesday night, we want to cover chapters five through eight. And then on Wednesday night, we want to cover chapters 9 through 11 and say a few brief words, perhaps, about the concluding chapters. But by covering uh, chapters 1 through 11, we will have covered the body of the book and the major themes that the epistle unfolds. My objective for tonight is very modest. Uh, I want to simply introduce you to the theme statements of the book of Romans, and I want you to go out of the auditorium tonight understanding the theme of the book of Romans. And in order to do that, and most of you could probably already turn to the verses, let's turn to the thematic statement of the book of Romans found in Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Romans 1, 16 and 17. These are very familiar verses indeed. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, I strongly sus suspect that although these verses are extremely familiar to most of you, that if you were to call be called upon to explain them, you would be, like I was for many, many years, highly likely to get them wrong. We are so used to these verses that we have very rarely stopped to think exactly what do they mean in the light of the entire book of Romans, and we would probably jump at a conclusion that might not be right. And I say this because I did that for many, many years, and that was partly because I always heard them presented in a certain way. And uh, it was really the discovery of what these theme verses were really about that opened up the book of Romans to me. Now, in order to appreciate the theme verse, uh, the theme verses, I should say, we should uh, look at a verse that is found in chapter 5. And so before I even make a comment on the thematic statements here, I invite your attention to Romans chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. Romans 5, 9 and 10. Much more than, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. It literally happened with me that these verses opened up not only the thematic statement of the book of Romans, but also, I think, the epistle as a whole. So we're going to begin with Romans 5, 9. I'll understand that uh, up toward the top of the overhead it's not always quite as clear as in other locations. Can you see this? That's good. All right, there is one basic observation that we need to make about Romans 5, 9. And that is that the idea of justification and the idea of salvation are distinguished. That is the most obvious fact about these verses. Having been justified by faith, we shall be saved from wrath. It is clear that the first statement about justification uh, belongs to the past. We have now been justified. That is, we are now in the state of having been justified. And the statement about salvation is assigned to the future relative to the uh, preceding statement. If we thought that in the book of Romans, justification and salvation were equivalents, we were mistaken. And it is the realization that in the book of Romans, justification is one thing and salvation is another 
that gets us into the very heart and core of this vital and important epistle. Notice that uh, it is said in connection with salvation, we shall be saved from wrath. Now, when we first read this, and when most people first read it, they probably say to themselves, the wrath that is referred to here is the wrath of eternal judgment. That's a conclusion that many people have leaped to. However, and this is something that you can test for yourself, and uh, if you find uh, what I'm going to say here uh, sometime during the course of the week, please bring me the passage. You can take a concordance, and you can look for the word anger or for the word wrath throughout the concordance, and uh, I'm suggesting to you you will not find a single place in the New Testament where anger or wrath refers to eternal judgment or to eternal damnation. Did you get that? Look in a concordance and see if you can find any place in the New Testament where the word anger or wrath clearly refers to eternal judgment. Now, eternal judgment, of course, occurs for the unsafe person at the great white throne, right? And if you are appearing in court, if you go down to the municipal court or the uh, state courts of the state of California, and you stand before a judge, and his face is flushed with anger and his eyes are flashing, uh, do you expect to get a fair hearing from the judge who is standing or sitting before you? I think not. One of the last things we would want to confront is an angry judge. Now, it is true that the book of Revelation says that before from the face of him who sat on the throne, which of course is the Lord Jesus Christ, the heavens and the earth fled away. But there's no suggestion, either there or anywhere else, that the judge is angry at the people standing before him. What happens at the great white throne is a fair and impartial judgment of every single individual who appears before that throne. So I want to emphasize for you that despite the ease and frequency with which we identify wrath and eternal judgment, that identification is really not supported in the New Testament. So the question is raised, what wrath is this? We shall be saved from wrath, but from what wrath shall we be saved? I want to suggest to you that the most logical place to go is back to the very first place in the epistle to the Romans where the word wrath is mentioned, which, as indicated here, is in chapter 1, verse 18, which immediately follows what verses? 16 and 17. <laughs> uh, obvious observation, but 16 and 17 are the thematic verses that we just read, right? And immediately after those verses, we have the first reference in the book of Romans to wrath. So now I'm going to ask you to flip back to chapter 1. And to verse 18. This is a passage we need to read. We may be somewhat familiar with it, but it's important for the passage to have its impact on us at this point in time. So let's read it. Follow me, if you will. Are you all awake? All right, be careful. Uh, be sure I read it as it is found in the text. For the wrath of God shall be revealed from heaven. Good. I knew that the people at Coast Bible were alert. You have to listen to Arch all the time, and that makes you stay alert. Yes, for the wrath of God is revealed, not shall be revealed, but is revealed. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. This describes, of course, man's inexcusable descent into idolatry. 
having the testimony to the Creator God before their eyes, they turn away from the Creator God and they make their own gods who are images of man, of animals, and even of snakes. Therefore, verse 24, therefore, God also gave them up. Notice that this is a key theme here. And the, the words gave them up will occur several times in this passage. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up, second time. God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lusts for one another, men with men committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. This is a description of evil in Paul's day, and it's very, very contemporary, as you recognize. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, not only do them or do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. This is much more than a simple indictment of the wickedness of mankind. This is an expression of the wrath of God against a race of people, who have turned away from their Creator, and as a result of their rejection of their Creator, they are successively turned over to their own depravity, to their own wickedness, to their own debased mind and behavior. So if we ask, what is the wrath of God that is revealed from heaven against the unrighteousness and ungodliness of men, the answer to that question is, it is the wrath that is seen in the descent of mankind into the very depths of depravity and evil. We are seeing that, of course, happening in our own country, a country that at least uh, in, on the surface once acknowledged uh, God and acknowledged that liberty came from God. And we are seeing a country that is turning away from that and in the process is descending into the pit which is described in these verses. This is the wrath of God against the unrighteousness and ungodliness of men. So I want to suggest to you that the logical reference of 5.9, uh, when it speaks of being saved, is to the wrath that has been extensively described in chapter 1. Okay, so to summarize what we have here, in Romans 5.9, we discover that justification and salvation are two distinct considerations for Paul. We also discover that salvation is salvation from wrath and not from eternal judgment, but from the wrath that is currently revealed against the unrighteousness of men. What would that kind of salvation consist in? Well, obviously, it would consist in escaping the depravity, escaping the debased lifestyle and and mental outlook of the world around us. That would be what this salvation would necessarily refer to. Now, let's take our trip back to Romans 1, shall we? We're already there with 118, but from 5.9 we return to the thematic statements of Romans 1, 16 and 17. Please notice, as we've already pointed out, the connection of uh, salvation that unites 5.9 with Romans 1, 16 and 17. Let me ask you, if you've never heard this uh, preached from this pulpit, although Arch may well have preached this, when you read the statement, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation 
Did you think of that in terms of salvation from hell? Or did you think of it in terms of salvation from wrath? Obviously, those would be two different considerations. You will be interested to know that the word salvation that is used here in 116, or the reference to salvation that we have here in 116, there is no further reference to salvation in the book of Romans till we get to 5.9. Did you realize that? That the great chapters on justification, particularly Romans 3 and 4, do not contain any reference at all to salvation. Therefore, we must uh, conclude that Paul knew what he was doing when he was writing this, and that the salvation that he is referring to in Romans 1.16 is not justification, but the salvation that is mentioned and distinguished from justification in Romans 5.9. We've already mentioned that the salvation in Romans 5.9 is salvation from wrath, and that uh, 5.9 points us back to the extended discussion of wrath in 1.18. So we may conclude that uh, Romans is not talking about salvation from wrath, from uh, hell, but salvation from wrath. What does this mean, therefore, for the familiar phrase, it is the power of God for salvation? Very simply, God gives every believer the power to escape his present wrath. Let me repeat that. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation. Not salvation from hell, but salvation from wrath. The gospel contains within itself the power that the believer needs to escape the present wrath of God. Let's get down to the practical level here. Suppose, suppose someone is a homosexual. We read how that was part of the manifestation of the wrath of God as described in 118 to 32. One question that is sometimes asked is, can a homosexual change? Can he change his personal orientation? There have been efforts, of course, as you know, to trace homosexuality to genetic inheritance. The evidence for this is not by any means very good. But the question still remains, since God uh, condemns homosexuality, is it possible for a homosexual to change his behavior? Answer, the gospel contains the power that he needs to do that. The gospel contains the power that he needs to do that. Suppose a man is habitually sexually immoral, not homosexual, but simply immoral. And that is a a kind of addiction for that person. Can such a person escape from his sexual addiction, from his immoral practices and behavior? Answer is, the gospel contains the power of God for him to escape from that. It does not matter what form the present wrath of God has taken in the life of an individual. The gospel contains the power to release and deliver and save that man from that manifestation of God's wrath. Now, as far as we know, In all likelihood, the book of Romans was written from the city of Corinth. And you may or may not know this, but Corinth widely had a reputation for debased lifestyles and for heavy-going immorality. In fact, a, a word had entered the Greek language to Corinthianize, and to Corinthianize was to behave uh, immorally. It was a word that had entered the language because of the reputation of Corinth for debased living. So when Paul, writing the epistle to the Romans, looked out on the city from which he was apparently writing, he saw a city that was a prime example of the wrath of God. He saw in the corruption and depravity that existed in Corinth a manifestation of God's anger against the unrighteousness and ungodliness of men. But he is able to say... 
I am very proud of the gospel that I preach. I am very proud of it. I am not ashamed of this gospel one bit. Because in this gospel is contained the power of God to every believer to escape, to be saved from a debauched and debased lifestyle, to be saved from the wrath of God. So I hope that uh, that clarifies a little bit uh, what Paul has in mind in verse 16 of chapter 1. We are talking about what the gospel contains intrinsically, the power of God to deliver men from immorality. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why? Did you notice the little word for there? I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for, because, if you ask Paul, why are you not ashamed of the gospel? Paul would say, because in it is the power of God for salvation. Now the next question we might ask is, why does the gospel contain the power of God for salvation? I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, to everyone who believes. Why is that true? The answer is in verse 17. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. The reason the gospel contains the power of God to deliver men from wrath is because in the gospel... The righteousness of God is revealed. We must pause here to say, what does he mean by this? What is the righteousness of God that is revealed in the gospel? The answer is certainly made clear to us uh, in chapter 3, verses 21 to 24. Would you just look over at those verses, please? Let's begin our reading, however, at uh, verse 19 of chapter 3. 319. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Here is the flat and unambiguous statement that Paul is making that under the law and by the deeds of the law or by trying to keep the law, no one plus no one plus no one will ever be justified. Instead, the law brings all mankind under guilt. So what is man's resource? Verse 21. But now, the righteousness of God, the phrase that we encounter in Romans 1.17, the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is through faith in Jesus Christ, to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. What is the righteousness of God? It is God's own righteousness, but it is a righteousness that God imparts to everyone who puts faith in his son's name. To everyone who believes in Jesus Christ, God gives his perfect complete righteousness. Notice, therefore, that we can now begin to enter into the connection that we noticed in 5.9. Having been justified by his blood, that is, having received the righteousness of God that is granted to people who believe, having received that righteousness, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Notice the very close connection here. What is implied is clearly this, 
that no one can be saved from the present wrath of God who is not first justified. Let me repeat that. Nobody can be saved from the present wrath of God who is not first justified or who does not first receive the righteousness of God which is bestowed on every believer. Why is that true? Glance back at uh, chapter 1 and verse 18 again. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Why does God reveal his wrath from heaven? Why does God allow men to descend into the pits of depravity? Answer, because God's wrath is revealed against the unrighteousness of men. Now listen, if God's wrath is against those who are unrighteous, how can those who are unrighteous ever be saved from that wrath? Answer, by becoming righteous. First, obviously, they can't do it by the works of the law. And therefore, the only righteousness that is available to them is the righteousness of God. And God's first step in delivering men and women from his present wrath is to offer them his perfect righteousness by faith. And it is not until a person has received the righteousness of God, which is by faith, it is not until then that they can be saved from his present wrath. Is that point clear? That's a very critical point. Not until the righteousness of God is bestowed upon an individual by faith, not until then can he be delivered from God's wrath, because God's wrath is against unrighteous people. But if I have been justified by faith, I am now righteous in the sight of God, and it isn't reasonable for me, therefore, to expect him also to deliver me from his wrath. Of course, that is reasonable. That is right for me to expect that. So having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. What did I do? One more look at Romans 1, 16 and 17. The gospel is God's power to salvation, understand salvation from wrath, because it discloses the righteousness of God which is given to every believer. And here, by way of parentheses, I want to suggest to you, I'm not the only one who has made this suggestion, and it's certainly not original with me, that the famous statement that is quoted in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, the just shall live by faith, ought to be translated, the one who is just by faith shall live. The one who is just by faith shall live. Let me give you quickly some simple statistics that will help to reinforce this. In the book of Romans, the word to live and the word life occur only two times in Romans 1 to 4, covering the justification section. And in the Christian life section, verses uh, chapters 5 through 8, the words occur 12 times. Got that first picture? You don't need to have the, the figures down or anything like that. If you take the word to live in life, and you look through Romans 1 to 4, you'll only find them two times. One of them is in the, the verse that we're looking at. If you take the words to live or life and look for them in Romans 5 through 8, you'll find them 12 times. Now, here's another statistic. The word to believe, that is the verb believe. In Romans 3 and 4 alone, the great justification chapters, the words to believe occur eight times. In Romans 6 through 8, the Christian life section, it only occurs once. How about the word faith? In chapters 3 and 4 of Romans, the word faith 
occurs 19 times. And in chapter 6 to, uh, through 8, the Christian life section, two times, both of them are in chapter 5, the first two verses. Outside of that, we get no reference to the word faith in Romans 6 through 8. What is the point that I am making? Very simple. In Romans, the word faith is connected with his discussion of justification. You can theologically connect it with Christian living, and there are appalling passages that do connect it that way, but not in Romans. In Romans, the word faith is connected to justification, and the word life is connected with the Christian life section. Got that? In Romans, the word faith is connected to justification. In Romans, the words to live or life are connected with the Christian life section. And that is one very good reason, not the only reason, for understanding that the word faith in Romans 1.17 is connected with the idea of justification and not with the idea of living. The one who is just by faith shall live. Now it is interesting, since Paul was, of course, a Hebrew, that in Hebrew the verb to live sometimes comes very close to meaning to survive alive or to be saved alive. In fact, in a couple of the Hebrew stems, as they are called, the Hebrew word to live means to save alive or to preserve alive. So from the standpoint of the uh, Hebrew thinker, the idea of living and salvation are much more closely united than they are to us who, who think in English. You follow what I'm saying? In English, it sounds like living and salvation are kind of disparate, different themes. But to the Hebrew thinker, the two themes were closely united because the word live could express more or less the same idea. In Habakkuk 2.4, from which this famous statement is taken, it seems to me that that's exactly the meaning of the word live there. Habakkuk, you remember, was uh, worried about the fact that the Babylonians were being used as an instrument of judgment, an instrument of God's wrath (laughs) against the nation of Israel. And uh, God answers him on that. And one of the things that God suggests is that the one who is just by faith can survive the experience of the wrath. He can be preserved alive. And I think that Paul is drawing that kind of concept of Habakkuk 2.4 into his thematic statement. So what does he do? First of all, he discusses how a man can be just by faith. That is, he discusses the great doctrine of justification by faith. We will look at that doctrine tomorrow night, the Lord willing, as we study chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4. Having established that one can be just by faith, now he wants to tell us that we can live, that we can be saved from the present wrath that is upon sinful men all around us. The one who is just by faith shall be saved, shall live. And that's the great Christian life section, Romans chapter 5 through 8, which, the Lord willing, we hope to look at on Tuesday night. Have you got it? Let me summarize it and then open it for questions. In the thematic statement of the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul is telling us that he is not ashamed of the gospel he preaches. The reason he is not ashamed of the gospel he preaches is because that gospel has the power to save men from the depths of sin and to transform their lives and to deliver them from the wrath of God. Why is it able to do that? It is able to do that because in the gospel is revealed how a man may be righteous in the sight of God. Since the wrath of God is conveyed against those who are unrighteous, God offers to unrighteous man a righteousness that is freely bestowed and received by simple faith. And those who do receive that gospel, who do receive that righteousness, who therefore become just by faith, can live. They can be saved from wrath through him. Let me conclude by 
pointing you back to Romans chapter 5 and verse 10, which we didn't look at. But notice how this is simply a restatement of the truth that we have just discussed. For if, Romans 5.10, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, that's justification, reconciliation, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his what? Life. And when we get into Romans 5 through 8, we will discover that the secret to living is our identification with the life of Jesus Christ. We have died in him. We have been raised in him. We are dead to sin. And we are alive to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Okay. Question. Right back there. Am I supposed to repeat these questions, Arch? Okay. I think so. Let me uh, see if I can repeat the, the question there. Um, in the light of the things that are said, for example, in 1 John about walking in the light and fellowship and so on, how does the gospel save people from uh, these uh, depraving and enslaving habits? Let me point out that what we have not said is that the gospel instantaneously and automatically saves people from this. But the, uh, the power of God is contained in the gospel so that this may be realized. Now, what we will discover uh, in Romans uh, 5, 6, 7, and 8 is that this process is not without its potential complications. So Romans 7 intrudes here where Paul discovers that it's uh, not so easy to get this done as he might have thought. And so there is a process involved. But the point is that at the moment that we are saved, all of the power that is needed for this is bestowed upon us. Now our uh, problem uh, and our task is to draw upon that power effectively. Of course, the Apostle Peter says the same thing, you remember, in Second Peter chapter 1, even as his e eternal power has bestowed upon us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So through the knowledge of him who called you uh, through his glory and virtue, you've got everything you need, but... He says, now I want you to add to your faith this, and add to your virtue this, and add to your, you know, and so on down the list. So, the point is, the potential is there. The power is there. The realization of this power is uh, a process which involves the uh, Johannine statements as much as any other statement of the scripture. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's got easier on his own kids than on the kids of the neighbor next door. Uh, I don't really think he is. In fact, one may argue that he's more severe because he chastens. Uh, whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. So, uh, you know, the, the, the ultimate punishment of the, the unsaved man is, is still ahead of him. And, uh, so, and God is trying to work with his own children to bring them out of this. What we're really saying here is something like this. Suppose a, a gay person comes to an evangelist and they say something like this. If I get saved, can God change me? And the evangelist should be able to say, if you get saved, God can change you. But what the evangelist should not say is God will automatically change you no matter what you do. <laughs> uh, or that God will let you go your own way uh, after you get saved and won't uh, stretch out his hand of chastisement. But this is the positive part of it. There isn't any problem that a person, uh, moral and spiritual problem, that a person brings into the Christian life that cannot be resolved by the power that God bestows on us from the very beginning. Now, this is, this is reasonable if we think of uh, this as an illustration as illustrated in human birth. When you give birth to a child, uh, when you become a parent, all of the potentials uh, that the child has are already there. <laughs> but the child has to grow and develop those potentials. And there is always the danger and possibility that potentials bestowed at birth may not ever be developed. So, for example, a man or a, a boy or a girl has a tremendous musical ability. Uh, this is uh, genetically imparted to them. Will they necessarily become 
uh, musicians? Not necessarily, but can they become musicians? Yes. Very accomplished musicians if they draw upon all the potentials that God has bestowed on that child at birth. And, uh, that's an analogy with what we're saying here. That in, the moment I believe the gospel, all of the potentials for God. Well, that's a very good question, and Arch always asks me these questions. They, you know, they, we use the theological terms, and he's uh, making me explain them for uh, my own benefit. Uh, one thing I always liked about Dr. Charles Rary is he wrote uh, uh, object lessons for kids. That's one of the things that made him a good theologian. He could bring it all down to the kids' level. So it's a challenge to me to, to try to do that. I don't think I can do it as well as Dr. Rari. But righteousness, uh, the righteousness of God amounts to this, that God clears us of every charge of sin. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? When God imparts his righteousness to you, he is saying, I have no charge of any kind against you before my judgment throne. Nothing that will bar you from my presence forever. Nothing. Remember uh, Balaam's prophecy about uh, Israel? He uh, stood up, and much to the displeasure of Barak, he, he said, God has not beheld iniquity in Israel. Well, God saw a lot of iniquity in Israel. But the point was that he had chosen Israel and accepted Israel, and he didn't see any of that as a bar to his relationship with them. So when God gives us his righteousness, he is clearing us of every charge. We are as righteous as God himself is. That's an amazing thing. And how anybody thinks that they can get that partially by doing, doing right is beyond me. Nobody can be as righteous as God in practical experience, but we can be as righteous as God by justification. What does justification mean? Well, it means declaring us innocent, <laughs> declaring us righteous, declaring us free of every charge that could possibly ever condemn us and debar us from the presence of God. This is a grand and, and wonderful truth, it seems to me, and, and one that is gradually being uh, lost in confusion in the contemporary church. But when God saves us, he clears us of everything, past, present, and future. Yes, sir, this gentleman right here. How is his ma wrath manifested if we have not accepted him? Well, just watch the life of an unsaved person who doesn't know God and notice how they get worse and worse and as they deteriorate morally, they accumulate all sorts of problems. And the result is that they, you know, it's like being caught in quicksand. And the, the more they struggle, the deeper they, they sink. So in the Romans 1.18 to the end of the chapter passage, that's really what's being described, how God just simply turns men over, turns men over to the, the vileness and the corruption of their own behavior. He lets them go. That's his wrath. Instead of stopping them, he lets them go. The lady right back here. Yes, it will. We can be saved from wrath through him, but if we, if we turn our backs on the, the power that God has given us, upon the resources that God has given us, then our uh, experience will continue to be the experience of unsaved people. What, uh, what Paul is going to tell us in uh, Romans 5 through 8 is that a new lifestyle is possible, but it is very clear as we read Romans 5 through 8 that it's not automatic. It isn't, uh, as some people think, okay, I've become a Christian, and from now on I'm going to live like a Christian. Uh, we all wish that it were like that, but it's not, that's not the way it is. And it's very clear, as you read uh, Romans 5 through 8, that that's not the way it is. That, in fact, very large impediments stand in our way because we are still in the old physical body that uh, we were in the moment before we were saved. And uh, so if I continue to live under the wrath of God, I will continue to experience it. But the point is that I don't need to. I don't have to. Uh, I can be delivered from that. Jack of the revised mind? Yes, there's no reason to, to think otherwise. Uh, what the uh, book of Romans calls us to is, of course, the renewing of our minds, that we may prove that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, but that's apparently a process and an ongoing process. It can stop. And when it stops, 
When a Christian gets out of fellowship with God, decides that they're not going to go God's way, I've met a lot of Christians like that, then all of the consequences that are uh, elaborated in Romans chapter 1 can be the experience of that Christian. It is amazing how mixed up a Christian can become. It is amazing what depths of depravity a Christian can stoop to while still trying to justify the depravity uh, by uh, even sometimes theological means. We had a, a case in seminary of a doctor who came to the seminary and uh, he was married and he fell in love with another woman and without any biblical grounds whatsoever, he divorced uh, his wife and, and married the other woman. Then he said, however, that uh, the Bible, when it talks about marriage, talk, is talking about spiritual union. And there had never been a spiritual union between him and his wife, and therefore he was not really married to his wife, and he was free to divorce her and marry somebody else. If that is not a debased mind, <laughs> I don't know what is. And that kind of thing can happen. Right here, the uh, let's see. If I'm going to I'm going to go to people that haven't had questions yet, if you don't mind, and I think Bob down here. Uh, I don't. Uh, only the passage now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. But uh, that would be the only one. All the others, it seems to me, are uh, references to this kind of salvation here. It is very striking that the word salvation does not occur in any justification passage. Because that that's not under discussion. We'll be glad to address some of the specific passages uh, when we come to it, but my answer would be that, and even in the passage I've just quoted, he's obviously talking about uh, our deliverance uh, from all uh, forms of sin uh, when the Lord comes. Right over here. It is directed toward all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men, whoever that might be, but that's primarily the non-believer, of course. Yeah. Yes, the, uh, there, the word wrath is used as the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. And this refers, it seems to me, to eschatological wrath, to the wrath of the day of the Lord, to the ultimate expression of God's uh, displeasure uh, with sin. So yes, uh, Paul acknowledges that use of it. If we ask ourselves the question uh, in Romans 5.9, to which of these references to wrath is Paul likely to be referring, I think... The, the uh, heavy weight falls on the wrath that he has extensively referred to and described, and which comes immediately after the theme verse. But Paul, of course, does have a doctrine that God's displeasure with sin has a future manifestation in, uh, in eschatological terms. I would point out here, however, that this is still God's temporal expression of, of displeasure against sin. It does not refer to eternal damnation even in the Romans 2 verse that you correctly quote. Uh, still, God's wrath is confined to time. So there will be a period in which uh, the human race will find the wrath of God intensified to the level of the judgments that occur during the tribulation period. But for the present time, the kind of wrath that we actually see in operation is the kind described in 118 and following. Go ahead with your follow-up question. Well, first of all, I want to say that the word for wrath that we're dealing with here, of course, is the Greek word orge, and is the standard Greek word for anger. And uh, I think it would be inappropriate for us to say that God is incapable of holy anger. As a matter of fact, uh, when Jesus was here, there were times that he was angry and expressed his anger. But now what we must know about God is that uh, God's anger is relatively brief compared uh, to the, the deserts of men, the sinfulness of man, and so on. So that God's orge, his anger, his displeasure, is confined to, to time and is not eternal. I think that's the point I want to make here. Eternal judgment is not an expression of his anger, but an expression of his righteous judgment. It is not the, the judge sitting behind the the podium and flushed with anger, and whose anger continues throughout all eternity. That's a false picture of God. But there is such a thing as holy anger, and even the Bible says to us, Be ye angry, <laughs> and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your anger. That's the word orge, or orgizo, the, the verbal form of this. So, God is a person. 
And God does have emotions, but they are not uncontrolled emotions as human beings often express. And oftentimes people lose control of their anger um, and uh, do it very inappropriately. But God never does inappropriate anger, nor does he keep his anger forever, as the scripture says. Yes, that's very true, and that's an important thing to say. Uh, we're looking at it from the standpoint of God's temporary, temporal, I want, uh, it's temporary, but temporal is a better word here, temporal anger against sin. But as uh, the experience of the unsaved shows, their sin can have eternal consequences. And the same thing is true of Christians. And the loss of reward is an eternal consequence of our failure to live as God has empowered us to live uh, through the gospel. And therefore, the loss of reward, it's not an expression of his anger. It's an expression of, of his uh, righteous distribution or withholding of uh, reward to those who have served him or those who have not served him appropriately. That's a very good point. We, we always need to, to keep the appropriate distinctions in mind. We are never saying that the sin of man cannot have uh, eternal consequences. We're just simply saying that what we describe as the wrath or anger of God is confined to time. At least as far as I can see in the New Testament, that's always true. I think that's perfectly true. And I think if you had been uh, talking to the Apostle Paul, uh, he would have been the first to say to you that not all unsaved people experience God's anger to the same extent or to the same degree and that insofar as a man may live a relatively moral life, uh, he may escape some of the more uh, depraving consequences of wrath. But nevertheless, for all sin, uh, uh, particularly for sin that is uh, repeatedly engaged in, uh, there is some measure of wrath that expresses the displeasure of God with that sin. Um, it's someone, in, ans in asking a question, uh, mentioned the fact that that God has built this into life, and so he has. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. That's a law of life. And uh, if a person uh, is relatively moral and uh, relatively restrained in their life, their experience of uh, God's wrath will be greatly diminished, but it will not be entirely removed. We should also keep in mind that we live in a culture that, that has been impacted by the morality of Christianity. Uh, that's easily forgotten in Western culture today. Granted that Western society is deteriorating, uh, granted that Western society is losing its uh, moral moorings, nevertheless, the, as many people have pointed out, the foundation of the Western judicial system is uh, biblical morality. And there are people who are unsaved who are nevertheless impacted by the morality. Uh, this, of course, was true in Jesus' day. Uh, not all of the Pharisees were immoral people by a long shot but they were not saved. And so we do confront that reality. I think that's a good uh, uh, qualification to throw in there, that, that the measure and degree in which I experience the wrath of God will uh, depend on the measure and degree of my sin. But the, the horrible thing is, for the unsaved person, there are no restraints. The moral person, we, we've all heard cases like this, person who lived uh, a moral life for years and years, and suddenly they go wild. That they lose their morality. Their, their whole life is turned upside down. God gives them up, gives them up, gives them up. And that, that kind of giving up can occur at any time for any individual. Does that help? Good. Uh, no believer can ever lose his salvation, but we're not talking about that kind of salvation here. <laughs> we're talking here about salvation from wrath. That kind of salvation, if you, you're all uh, awake here, are you not? You're not going to be confused by this. They, uh, and if you are, Arch will straighten me out here and get me to define it further. Salvation from wrath can be lost if I cease to experience my union with the life of Christ. I have to walk with God. I have to let Christ live his life in and through me. As long as I do that, uh, I will not experience uh, wrath. But if I cease to do that, then the experience of wrath can overtake me. But salvation from hell is something that can never be lost. Jack. 
That's a great question, but Jack, may I be permitted to postpone it till Tuesday night when we'll be covering the uh, Romans 5 through 8 section? That's exactly what we want to talk about. In fact, I would, would like to say this, that in my judgment, the most extensive treatment of the experience of Christian living is precisely Romans 5 through 8. And if we can't answer it from that uh, section of the Bible, we can't answer it. <laughs> but I think there are answers, but I think that should be developed uh, in connection with uh, those chapters. Right. Well, that's a, that's a starter. Uh, then you have to apply Romans 5 through 8. Uh, this gentleman right over here. Well, I'm ad ad admitting, along with the gentleman over here, that Paul does talk about a day of wrath that is future. He does refer to it in uh, Romans chapter 2, the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. And then he goes into a little detail about what that will be like. And the question, therefore, that we raise in connection with 1 Thessalonians is what wrath is referred to here uh, in this particular epistle. And I think the, the telltale clue to this is found in uh, 1 Thessalonians 1.10, we turn to God from idols to, wait, to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven who delivers us from the wrath to come. The wrath to come clearly indicates that this is future and therefore not the present wrath that we are talking about tonight. And then when uh, chapter 5 begins, the allusion is back to that wrath. And obviously the context shows that we're talking about a future wrath. But please understand the common thread between the kind of wrath that is concurrently revealed and the kind of wrath that will be revealed is that they both are expressed in time and not in eternity. Romans 1, 18 and following is what is expressed right now, and we can look out at the world and we can see it. I mean, this is such a graphic description. If we can't see that in our world, we we're really can't see anything. It's there. But the wrath referred to in, uh, in Romans 2.7 and in 1 Thessalonians 1.10 and in 1 Thessalonians 5 is the wrath to come. We don't see that yet. And we won't see it because we'll be with Christ uh, when it breaks. Arch, that's right. That's right. That's right. And we may say that uh, the... The world, because of its uh, increasing depravity, uh, deserves an increased measure of wrath. What we see no, uh, now is not all that it deserves, and it is uh, rapidly building toward the day when the fullest expression of God's wrath will be revealed and all of the calamities that are described by the, the book of Revelation. And that's why in chapter 2 of Romans he talks about the, the man who treasures up for himself wrath in the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. Through your hard and impenitent heart, he says, you treasure up wrath in the day of wrath. So here we are, mankind is already under the wrath of God. Does he repent? No. Does he change his ways? No. What is he doing? He's storing up more wrath, building up the wrath that will break on him during the tribulation period. Exactly. Exactly. Yes, sir. What came across my life? <laughs> Well, I would love to say I had a vision, but uh, I don't think that would fly here in, in uh, Coast Bible. <laughs> and Arch might not invite me back, and then I would lose the hospitality. I would be under Arch's wrath if I said that. <laughs> uh, so, uh, no vision. Let me tell you how it happened, however, because I do have a very clear recollection of how it happened. Uh, I was wrestling with Romans 10, 9, and 10. And uh, I, w uh, I was a freshman uh, in Wheaton at that time. And uh, for some reason or other, Romans 10, 9, and 10 had not bothered me very much uh, uh, before then. But uh, for some reason or other, I was uh, concerned about the meaning of Romans 10, 9, and 10. And uh, as I thought about it and wrestled with it and prayed about it, and I definitely did pray about it, I remember realizing in Romans 10, 9, and 10 that righteousness and salvation are distinguished there. We'll come to that on Wednesday night. The same distinction between uh, righteousness and salvation that we pointed out tonight. And then the book of Romans opened up to me kind of like a flower. I, uh, I went back to 5, 9, 
and back to 116 and 17. And it was at that point that I realized that the distinction between a righteousness and salvation was the key to understanding Romans. So that's how it happened. And uh, that was a long time ago. If you're talking about my freshman year at Wheaton, you're talking about near antiquity. <laughs> and the interesting thing is that as I've studied Romans in the years that have followed, uh, the study has done nothing but but confirm that particular insight. I had never heard that. In, I had never heard that distinction made. Never. To the very, very best of my knowledge, I had never heard it anywhere or read it anywhere. Now, most of the things that I teach and preach, I've heard somewhere or read somewhere. We were talking at lunch today about a couple of things I've got in power to make war, and I heard them or read them. <laughs> and fortunately, nowhere I heard them or read them. But this, no. And I've always considered this an answer to my struggle with Romans 10, 9, and 10, uh, an insight which God is capable of giving to anybody who wants to dig into the Word and really wants to know it, and one that has confirmed itself repeatedly as I've uh, come to a more mature appreciation of the argument of Romans. So that's how it happened. This is a distinction uh, for which I would, um, I want to say, go to the stake. And I think uh, this is important enough that if they were lighting the fire, I would not recant. I believe this very firmly. Thank you. It's been very interesting. We'll start tomorrow night with Romans 1 through 4, God willing.